Word of God. And how, how do you read it? Maybe that's forever in your mind. Encinas uh, will be there. <laughs> but you're not going to forget the Gospel of Luke, are you? Chapter 5. There. All right. And so uh, the power, again, the Gospel of Luke is a narrative. It, it is written to a Gentiles. It's written to the Gentiles. And so uh, Luke has gone back and gotten given eye, getting eyewitness accounts of things that happened. We know that most likely that he's talked to Jesus' mother. He's talked to Mary because there was very intimate deals, details that are not in any other of the Gospels. And so he's giving us just eyewitness accounts. There's many things that have been done by Jesus Christ, but these things are written. These things are in the Gospel. And again, it's from a Jewish mindset or a Gentile mindset. So a lot of things about, uh, are explained there. In Matthew's Gospel, uh, Matthew doesn't give geography. He, everyone just knows where that certain place is, and, and he's writing to the Jewish mindset. So again, sometimes we get a little geography here in Luke's Gospel. And they just recount it. And again, people know of the Gospel. People know of the, of the Word of God, and they know some things. And so Theophilus sends Luke back to, to get some further detail. They, you know, we see that in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, and we see that in the book of Acts. And now... He's given them a, a fuller detail. So we're going to go through the narrative here. That's why we're reading through the chapters at a time. So for those of you listening online, read the chapter first and then come back to this message. Welcome back. All right. So verse 1. So it was that as the multitude... Remember, again, go back and get the last week's studies about what the multitude is describing. These These are onlookers. These are curious people. This crowd and this multitude. People just come. It's just mob mentality. They know that something's going on. They're going to go out to see John the Baptist. And now they're coming around and, and they're seeing things. Jesus is establishing himself. And again, the miracles are going out and uh, people are coming to him. Last week, we uh, saw that of one of uh, uh, Peter's mother-in-law being healed. We've seen others just, again, demons being cast out. And so the multitudes are pressing around him, and he's around uh, Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee, Lake Gennesaret. And he said, why do they call it the Sea of Galilee? Well, if that's a big body of water, and that's all you've ever seen, you've never seen the Mediterranean or anything else, that's a big sea. It's, it's 12 miles long. At its deepest point, it's 1,200 feet deep, and it's anywhere from five to seven miles across, depending on the drought season or whatever. And so it's a pretty big lake, and so they're crossing over it many a times, and so here they are. And at this time, there's about nine towns that are around, around this whole circumference of the Sea of Galilee. And that's about 15,000 people uh, accumulated around those towns. So many can come out, and they can come out and see Jesus Christ here. But he comes to them, and he asks them to launch their boat. And now, Simon, this is different than uh, Mark and Matthew's gospel. And they're good news. Uh, Peter and, and James and John, Peter had already had come with Jesus. Jesus already talked to him. And again, this is, they're not mending the nets. They're washing their nets. These are, uh, you might you think, minute details, but it really differentiates between the Gospel of Mark and, and Matthew. This isn't like, again, as you've gone through this, and he says, follow me. He just doesn't walk up to Levi, the tax collector, out of the middle of nowhere and looks at him and says, follow me. And, and then Matthew goes, I will. I, it, just, it wasn't this, uh, you know, phantom power or whatever, this, uh, you know, Jedi mind trick or something like that. You will follow me. I will follow you. And, 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 no. These people know about Jesus Christ. He has been. He is Jesus. Christ isn't his last name. Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. He is Jesus of Nazareth. Give him a little detail right there. He, they've already, maybe they've already been baptized by John the Baptist. We know that a couple of Simon's partners, James and John, they were disciples of John the Baptist. Simon had already followed Jesus for a while. I want you to understand this. By the, by the time he comes back here, Peter is fishing again. He had already met him earlier in Matthew and Mark's gospel where he talked about laying. He already talked to him again. He already talked to him before about being a, a fisher of men. You might say, well, no, I, I guess, I guess you know, this is a different translation or whatever. Because we all know in Matthew's gospel, he says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, here he tells them that, you know, come and follow me and you will catch men. Uh, Simon had already walked with the Lord, had already followed and been in that ministry. He's back fishing again, and now the Lord comes back. So, so you catch the whole scene there. Here's, again, we get a little bit of this in the narrative, but now we're getting a little bit more detail right here. And so now they're washing their nets. In other words, the day's done. They're, they're, they're cleaning, they're washing the nets, and, you know, the sun is up, and Jesus gets out into this boat to, to teach. And, and there's, there are quite bit, thousands, 
that are following Jesus Christ at this time. Hundreds, if not hundreds. And people say, well, how can you do that? I've been in the Sea of Galilee. I've been there and you can be. It's like this natural amphitheater, this bowl, and you can talk. And I've taken groups there like early in the morning. And again, this isn't like later in the day. By the time the sun comes up, the fishing's done. They're, they're out at three and four in the morning. They're out at what, two, three, four in the morning not fishing. And by the time the sun comes up, uh, they're already bringing in their nets. And so, and I don't know much about fishing, but I know this when I go there and I study the land, and, and that's their timetable, and that's their schedule. The sun's already up, it's no longer, and Jesus gets in this boat to, to teach. And it's Simon's boat. It's not, it's not by coincidence. It's not all of a sudden, all right, Simon, here's your thing. And this isn't the first time Simon, we know him as Peter, this isn't the first time he's hearing Jesus. And he gets in his boat, and he, and he puts him out, just launch out. And then he, about telling them the nets. And, and, but understand the words there. Understand this. Because he obeyed the word of God. If you're taking notes, it's a very important thing. He didn't, he didn't settle with them before. And in Matthew and Mark's gospel there, he kind of, you know, tried to instruct him a little bit there. But no, he just, because he obeyed the word of the Lord, very key for us here today, they launched out and then they cast their nets. And then this big catch comes in which has happened before. It's a miraculous thing. It's happened before. And now he's calling in James and John. Before there was a catch where it was just one boat and they, they got 153 fish and that's a whole different Bible study there. But now, now so much coming in. And understand this, James and John had gone back to fishing. James and John were followers of, of, John, of, of John the Baptist and, and they know about Jesus. And they know what, what they were there when John said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They saw Jesus get baptized. They saw, and they even heard, they saw the, what they see in the form of a dove descending upon Jesus Christ. And that voice, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah, they, they were there. And they went back fishing. They got all this information. They know about this. So, so don't think when you're reading through the gospel that Jesus just walks up and say, follow me. And then they just, we will. And, just, and we're just these little robots. There's a lot of history there. There's a lot of uh, intimacy that's going on there. And then there's these private conversations. We might call that like an inside joke. Have you ever been around someone and then you, you got, you know, something happens and you kind of look at each other, <laughs> you know, oh, we're all laughing. And then the person is like, what? You're laughing. You're laughing at me. Why are you laughing at me? I'm out of here. I hate these people. And they're gone. All right. And that's a little problem with the inside joke there. I mean, Emily knows, right? See, that's an inside joke. All right. So but you all stayed, so it's on you now. So, <laughs> so here's the thing is that he comes, and, he, and, and not by random, just there he is. He's in Simon's boat, and he's beginning to teach and doing these things and cast the nets out and do these things, a miraculous catch. And then he says, he says, do not be afraid. Be- before it was like, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's a cool statement. This isn't the same occurrence of all of Matthew and Mark's gospel. This is a totally different thing that's happening here. And he's telling them. And so why do you think he says to them, says them don't be afraid? Because they're afraid. Uh, you know, the, whether it be one of embarrassment, they're back fishing again. And, and, and if you're taking anything from this, Jesus came back for him. He'd make a good, good Marine. He always comes back for him. all right? And, we leave no one behind. He'd be good in the military anyway. But understand this, he, he comes back. And, and, and then we look at each and every one of our lives. How many of us have gone back to something? And then the Lord shows up. We, we call it backsliding. There's only one time the, the word backsliding is used. And it's in Ezekiel there in the Old Testament. But we talk about backsliding. We talk, and, and you go back to that. And the Lord shows up. It's happened to me a few times. There's a few times I've gone back. And after the, like the last one, I said, that's it. I'm not going back to that anymore. But God can use one of the devil's own pawns to bring back one of his children. That's what happened in my life. And so this thing is that you go back and then the Lord meets you there. And then he tells you things like, don't be afraid. One particular time was I was going up for my court martial. And I had a lot of charges on me. And the night before, I just gave my life back to the Lord. And a guy who was discipling me, was ministering to me, and he, he tells me a couple weeks earlier, he says, you know, when the pastor was telling the story about how if a little lamb, you know, keeps wandering away from the flock, uh, how, and I said, I know the story, I know the story, and I really did say it like that because I was stoned. I know the story. 
that he hurts the little lamb. So the lamb has to be injured and has to stay with the flock for protection. So, so what? What God's going to do? He's going he's to hurt my little leg or something like that? He goes, no, you're going to be in a body cast. <laughs> I was afraid. I was afraid. I, but I, I was, wasn't going to show him that, really. Then he leaves the door. <laughs> and then the next couple of weeks, this is how quick it works in the military. I, I got 16 charges on me, and I'm going for a court-martial. I got my bags packed. I'm ready to go to the brig. And not only that, when you go to the brig, when you go and you get a court-martial, and you say, go away for six months, that means your enlistment has been extended because you got to pay back the six months. So I got bad time. I'm just uh, so that night, I give my life back to the Lord, and I'm in the body cast, and, and I go before, and, and just as easily, the charges are, are written on me there just as easily, and the first sergeant looks at me, says, you're pretty stupid, aren't you? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Promise not to be stupid anymore? Promise uh, not to be stupid anymore. He just rips up the charges like that. So that's how, that's how quick it can work. And I just ran out of there, and he says, now get out of here. And I ran out of the door, and I said, ah, oh, I'm going to go get drunk. No, wait a minute, I'm born again again. I got church people. I got to find church people. <laughs> now you understand there, the, for the couple of months that I backslid, I was like Saul of Tarsus. I really persecuted a lot of the people that I had led to the Lord who were trying to lead me back to the Lord. And so, hey, I'm back. Ah, they would just scream. They'd shut their door on me. He's going to beat me up. And so I threatened to do that. And I did do that. And no, no, I'm really in. Jesus, Jesus, my savior. I just, I had to convince them for a little bit there. And he just began to go, but that was like the last time. But, but Jesus, understand, Jesus came back for me. I went back. I heard all the things. I walked with him. I did those things. But it got a little tough, got a little hard, you know. And, and I just went back, and yet Jesus came back for me. And he would tell me, now, don't be afraid. Because now I'd walked with the Lord for a little bit, been persecuted a lot, things like that, and I walked away from him. And now I really was afraid. When I first came to Christ, I'm, thank you. There is a God. I'm not him. I've accepted you, Jesus Christ, and I'm walking with you now. Things are great. Now things get a little tough. I've, now I'm dealing with temptation. Never dealt with temptation before. All of a sudden, I've got this war within me. And, and, and the Lord just begins to just minister to me. But then the flesh and the world and things like that. Uh, when you come up against something you don't know, you fall back on what you do know. And So I came up against some things I didn't know. And, and I just fell back on what I didn't know. That was just the things of the world. But he came back for me. And this time he says, don't be afraid. You see, I only backslid really full on. And I made up for the six months that I was walking with the Lord. I just did everything worse than before. And I probably would have come back to the Lord after about a month. Because I, I didn't last long as a backslider. I just did it. But then I, I lasted three more months in the backslide because, of, because I was afraid. You see, when I first came to Christ, and this is what happens, Christian. When you first come to Christ, you are just thankful that Jesus Christ forgives you. And you confess everything. And, and it's a slate's wiped clean. But then when you come back to Christ, and this is what holds up Christians. This is what holds up people from coming back. Because now you know you've got to go make things right. Now you know as a Christian, you know, the people that you've lied to and the things that you've done to. It isn't just, it's just the slate wiped clean. He does what Jesus wipes the slate clean. But now you've got to go and you need to love your brother and sister. And you need to go back and repent and apologize and ask for forgiveness. You have more knowledge now. And I was prideful and I was like, no, I don't want to admit this. And I know I can get there on my own. And, and so really, but praise God for me, I, I would have come back after a month, but it lasted four months. But there's some people who last 20 years. They go 20 years in backsliding. And it's the same issue. It, it never changes. There is nothing new under the sun. I lasted four months. Some people are lasting 20 years, and maybe you're here today. And if you're running from God, I just want to say, you found a strange place to hide today. Because <laughs> this is one of those churches, this is one of those pastors that I love you a lot, and nothing's going to hold back. <laughs> All right. I don't know what Emily's thinking there. And so we know that Jesus comes back from him and he tells them, don't be afraid. And maybe that's for some of you here today. And maybe you're not backslidden. Maybe you're just wavering. Or maybe you're on the, the fence about it. But he'll come back for you. But the thing is, is that, look, the thing that causes it is fear. I was in fear that maybe I wasn't going to get promoted. I was in fear maybe that the other Marines, like that, I, was, I wasn't going to be covered out in the middle of battle. I mean, <laughs> You know, my, the motto was to kill people and break things, and I got to have people around me and stuff. And I'm, maybe I got to do that. We had a thing in the military when we go to battle, borrow 50 bucks from somebody. Because that guy will keep you alive till payday. All right? I mean, the, and I'm just telling you the mindset in the military. We do that. 
as long as I owe you, you're looking out for me, all right? And, and then, and, but I want to let you know, guys weren't lending me money. They didn't, that wasn't, they, I don't want to, you're on your own. And the, these are the, so I got fearful. I got fearful of those things. And then, then, then fearful, maybe God wasn't going to forgive me because I would have to kill somebody. And, and you just those things that go on there, those things that I bear, then I know what God's doing. And, and I was good at killing people and breaking things. And then I come to the Lord and, and then I see that there's guys in the Bible, there's, there's soldiers in the Bible and God's just ministering to them. And I, and I began to understand Romans chapter 13 and those things. I was fearful because I, I never really got, I mean, I read Romans when I first got saved, and, but, but I, I really didn't understand God's word until someone started discipling me and, and explaining these things. So I can understand this is different, you know, than, than Matthew and Mark's gospel here. They full well know now. They, full, they have full knowledge. Some of you, you're getting married, you're going to marry your personality, and you're going to wake up the next morning with a character. All right? And then there's going to be time when you're getting, I didn't know you liked that. I just, there's this new McDonald's commercial out. You know how they're arguing over the Big Mac and the French fry? Any of you saw this? So many people. There's a thing called television. All right. And uh, <laughs> that happened. They're just newly married. Honey, do you want any French fries? Now, I understand. I go back. I'm old school. It was McDonald's. You had to actually order everything. You just couldn't say, number one, you actually had to say Big Mac, fries, and a Coke. And, do you want any French fries? She goes, no, I don't want any. You getting French fries? I go, yeah. She goes, oh, I don't want any French fries. This is, this is our first week of marriage. I mean, we'd known each other almost a year. This has never happened. And we're sitting down to drink the Coke and so and then she starts eating my French fries. I said, you didn't want any French fries. She goes, well, no, I didn't want to order any of mine. I didn't want a whole lot. And I go, you don't understand. There's a, there's a certain Big Mac fry ratio. <laughs> now, some of you know this. I didn't get last fry satisfaction. You can eat all the French fries, but when it comes down to the last French fry, you're going... Oh, this is the last one. And he began to savor that one. No last fry satisfaction. She says, I just, it's just, just. And then I noticed after I got married, I began to talk to myself a lot. She would say things like, Are you going to wear that? Of course I'm going to wear that. That's why I'm wearing it. I leave the house. I'm like, Why did she say that? What's going on here? What do you mean I'm going to wear that? What does she mean that? And I began to argue with myself and lose the argument. Then I'm wearing something else. Do you want something to eat? No, no, I'm fine. Then we're driving down the road for an hour. And she's like, there's Carl's Jr., there's Hardee's, there's Taco Bell, there's someone. Yeah, yeah, they are. After, are you going to pull over and get something to eat? Why didn't you tell me you were hungry? I did! I just thought she was pointing out all the places uh, <laughs> that she was odd with that. I don't, I don't speak woman. Every time I got to the end of the book of my wife, she added another chapter. I told her that. She says, then you better learn to speed read. <laughs> Do you understand? If I was to get married now, the minister would have to say, don't be afraid. <laughs> you understand? I have, I have full discourse now. I have full knowledge right now. I use a little bit of humor with this, but understand, this is a serious matter that don't be afraid. Don't be afraid from now on catch men. You see, the first phrase, follow me and I will make you fisher of men. And maybe that's for some of you today. You, 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 you've gotten that message. That, that it isn't the, the evangelism or, or sharing your faith isn't relegated to a certain body of Christ. They're the ones who do all the evangelism and stuff like that, and I'm just called to sit here or go to potlucks. Uh, that's my call to the body of Christ. Each and every one of us are to be a personal witness for Jesus Christ. A- and now he's saying, you're going you're to catch men. You see, in Matthew and Mark's gospel, they, they, left, their, they, they left their fathers, they left their families, and they, they followed Jesus. But it was only for a while. They're back fishing now. Remember, they weren't the apostles then. They were part of the crowd. They were part of the multitude. They, were, they, were part of the, they became disciples. They're following after him. And they're there. They can kind of see him around. But after a while, they just don't see him around anymore. And he goes back for them. He lives out that he leaves the 99 to go back for the one. And so he tells them, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Not that you can, but that you will. 
Now look at this. So when they had brought the boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Very poignant words here. Before they left things, now they're forsaking all things. And that might be with some of you in your relationship with the Lord. You're following Jesus. You've got the fire insurance. People ask me, hey, what do you do for a living? I'm giving away fire escapes. What? Oh, yeah. Give away fire escapes. You know, or whatever. What do you do? I sell fire insurance. Give it away for free. And they're like, what? And it's just, you know, I'm just fishing. I mean, well, maybe for some of you fishermen, that's called chumming. You just throw it all out there. And <laughs> someone, they're just nibbling. Oh, okay, that one's hungry. And I just, it's coming. I'm just, oh, what do you mean? Oh, I'll bite. Oh. I, maybe you want Jesus to be your Savior because you don't want to burn in hell, but you don't want to make him Lord. You see, this is the part where they're making him Lord. They're forsaking all. They walked with him before. Gone to church with them, gone to synagogue. They've even seen some of the miracles, and some of them, a couple of them, were John and John's disciples there. But now they're now they're forsaking all, and this is where it comes. And this is where it comes to the point in your own walk, in your own relationship with the Lord. That when will that time come? Now, for me, it happened early on. I walked with the Lord for about six months, backslid for six, and then that last time going up for my court martial. That's it. I'm forsaking all. And I'll tell you, I did my last two years in the Marine Corps as the best Marine ever and, and as a Christian and better than ever before because I, then I understood submission and loyalty. I had no fear going into battle after that because I know that I would be with the Lord. But my thing is, Lord, just keep me around to... And that's why I jokingly say I became a government-paid missionary. There was no separating church and state, man. You get it all. And that's the beauty about the military. You can't fire me. <laughs> what are you going to do? 15th and 30th, sick, lame, lazy, man. I'm getting paid. I'm going for it. What are you going to do? I'm telling you about Jesus. And no longer the fear of man. No longer being afraid. Well, what are you going to do? So I don't get the promotion. So I don't get those things. So what? Do you not understand that there's an eternity? And just as, as Tim was saying this morning about John 3.16, that song, I mean, that boils down the gospel to that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever shall believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Luke, who... Serving in the Marines now, when he was five years old, and we're at the Union Gospel Mission, he led his, he was actually four and a half, and he led a 55-year-old drunk to the Lord. And all he knew was John 3.16. And this guy's trying to ask him all kinds of questions. He goes, well, that's good, that's good sir, but all I know is, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever shall believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 45 minutes. Just hammering him, and hammering, and hammering him. And the guy got on his knees and prayed with a four and a half year old to accept Christ. You understand? That's what it really boils down to. And now as you grow and you walk with the Lord, okay, okay you're coming to church, you're coming and you learn the Bible study, you're getting more in you. And that's the whole thing. When you come up against something you don't know, you'll fall back on what you do know. And that's my goal and my desire as a pastor, as a teacher, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, but to get the word of God in you. I know from personal experience, I'll fall back on my training. I'll fall back. On, so I got to give you more information. You got to get it. And Jesus says, don't worry about in that time and that moment when you're brought before the governors and kings and the princes and all. Don't worry. In that time, I will bring back to remembrance all that I've said to you. You don't know the word of God. You're going to have that opportunity. You're going to go. Oh. But if you know John 3, 16, you're going to be okay. But just really, what is he going to bring back to remembrance? You can quote sermons, you can quote all these things, but, yet, but here's the thing, here's God's word. So here's the thing, verse 11, chapter 5, Gospel of Luke. Maybe that will be the day for each and every one of us here. Today's the day that you're forsaking all. You're, you're, you're a Christian. Jesus Christ is inside of you. He is your Savior. He is your Lord. You have fire insurance and you really do. And again, because, because Jesus spoke the word to Simon, he obeyed the word of Jesus. He obeyed obedience is the Christian's safety net. Obedience. If all you ever do is listen to Jesus Christ and obey Him, you're safe, man. That's your safety net. You can free fall all you want, but He's right there. Not like the comic I saw one time who draws this cartoon. This guy falls off a cliff and, and he's hanging onto a branch and he's just screaming, help me, someone help me, someone help me. And the sheer death below, someone help me. He hears this voice. He goes, I'll help you. Who is that? He goes, it's God. Let go and I'll catch you. The guy thinks for a moment, is there anyone else out there? Help! And we're just like, but that's that, that, the thing that you come in that step of faith. True story. This guy uh, trying to traverse uh, a canyon, 
fell down and was rolling down the hill and he grabs on and he was, and he just, and he just, uh, bless you. And he just, uh, was holding on for dear life to this. And he just figured it was just sheer death down below praying all night and stuff like that. And, and by his own testimony, it was like, he just felt Lord, that the, the Lord was going to be there for him. He's the guy who remembered the cartoon. There's a guy that I personally know of a guy I was in the military with. And, and yet he's holding on, he's holding on, he's holding on. By the time the sun came up and he could see, he was only two feet from the ground. But he had torn out all the ligaments and stretched out all the muscles in his shoulders because he was just hanging on. And he believed God was saying, just let go. And I just, and yet when the sun finally came up, I was like, that's it? I just had a couple of feet to go. He was on a safety part of the legend. He could have just gone to a trail and got off. There's friends of mine who have walked away from the Lord and, and, and uh, one friend of mine particularly was just a, uh, just arguing with God and he's on his uh, you know he's on his uh, you know rice rocket and he's just flying through the mountains there in California and he's having this argument with God you really exist God and I followed you and all this kind of stuff and I'd come back to the Lord sooner and I was telling him look God's going to put you in a body cast and traction you know when someone tells you guys to do a body cast and you tell that to someone else then you just kind of add it on and traction and screws and all this kind of, I mean. As he went through the guardrail, as he fell off his motorcycle and he's sliding, he's got leathers and he's just sliding and his bike goes out in front of him and he's like, ah, oh, and his bike just peels through the guardrail and just opens it up like a hot knife through butter and he sees his motorcycle go out in the canyon and just, and he just slides right to the edge and his feet are just dangling off the cliff. <gasps> God spoke to him. Same words. Don't be afraid. And he's been following them ever since. And those are, the, those are the things, man. These are what I call the Holy Ghost stories. And I, and I share with you these things that, that you don't be afraid. But at that point, look, you don't have to be like me who goes up for a court martial. You don't have to be like my friend who's hanging from a cliff. You don't have to be like my other buddy who sees his, sees his bike that he only had for like two weeks. And all those payments he's going to make. And that bike just goes through the guardrail for God to speak to you to say, don't be afraid. Those are extreme measures. And God will do that. But it can be today. You don't have to learn from others' mistakes. It can be the day that you are saying, that's it, I'm forsaking all. You've walked with the Lord for a while. You've been there for a while. But you really, really haven't said, I'm forsaking all. Before they have left, and remember, they, they've even walked with the Lord. They've even said, something, yeah, we've left everything for you. See, you haven't left mothers, brothers, fathers, sisters. You haven't. But now they forsake all. And then verse 12, and it happened when he was in a certain city, that behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and, and he fell on his face and implored him and saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I don't know what, where he's from, but you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and he touched him saying, I am willing. And he cleansed him. Now, first and foremost, let's just take the obvious. Leprosy. It's called Hansen's disease now. And Anna Hansen discovered it and or some cures and things like that, and he was able to retard the thing of leprosy. And you have to go online and read about leprosy. But understand, in the day of leprosy, uh, in the Jewish mindset, in the law, it represented sin. That if a person had leprosy, the, the thing was, was like, there must have been some sin in his life. God's punishing him. Before this health and wealth gospel and stuff that was preached nowadays, it was already out there in the Jewish mindset. That you, if there's leprosy, anything bad's happening to you, this is the way it is, there's something wrong, and you did something wrong. And the other thing is, is that it was established that 300 feet in front of people, you had to say, unclean, unclean. That's your whole life. Unclean, unclean. Your parents, no one. This person could not be touched. Imagine what it is. I have friends who have adopted some babies when the, the Iron Curtain came down in the Ukraine and Russia and Bulgarian stuff, and there's these, they have a detachment disorder there where these babies that were, uh, were put immediately into uh, uh, orphanages right after birth, and they never had any human touch. Never had any human touch. And here they are growing, and within five, six months, I mean, these, these babies, and then they're adopted out, and, and, and there was this whole thing. I want you to say, Americans were adopting these kids, and they were sending them back. What's wrong with these kids? Got to fix them or something like that. And that, that's what's happening there. These kids had never been touched. They never bonded with a mother. Never had that thing with, when they were birthed and laid on a mother's chest there. And they were cut. None of that. And these kids could literally could not. They had no social skills. They couldn't. They had no trust issues and stuff like that. We need to be hugged. 
That's why it tells us in the Word of God to, to greet each other with a holy kiss. Not a lip lock, a holy kiss. It could be a hug, it could be a handshake, all right? <laughs> and so the, the, the thing is that, that we need touch there. We need that. We know that. That's the way God's designed us. He's designed us to be communal. He designed us to be with one with one another and, and we to do those things and to share. This guy, his own mama. Now, I'll share a story with you. I, my mom did the best she could with what she had to work with and I'm from a second marriage. I'm the only child from a second marriage. i got brothers and sisters way older than me, so I'm like an only child in that time frame or whatever. And by the time my mom, she had to raise six kids. Her husbands had left her, and she's raised. I mean, I never really was raised like the, the baby, the youngest of the family. She's pretty much fend for yourself. I wasn't a latchkey kid. Our door was broken in so many times by the cops, we just didn't lock it. So I didn't need a key anymore. And that's just the way that I just grew up, and I grew up in the 60s, and, 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 and just not, I mean, there was touch there. But here's the thing. When I was in that fire, saving that man's life years ago, and I got burned up and went to the hospital. <laughs> it was my life I was saving, for those of you who are near today. And Brother Tim brought me two and a half gallons of gas, and I'm uh, not going down alone on this one, brother. Welcome back. Uh, so I started that bonfire, and I was on fire for Jesus, and... Uh, Thought I was going to hear, good and well done, thy faithful servant. All I heard was, you're well done. <laughs> My mommy came to visit in the hospital as I was there for a month. And the, at the age of 40, I had the first memory in my life of my mother ever feeding me soup. I don't know what she was doing with everyone else, man, but all I remember, my mom says, you want me to stay another week? And I'm like, yeah. So my mom, because at the age of 40 is the first remembrance that I had. I mean, maybe you or mommy's, your babies cuddled you and or they cuddled babies and all that kind of stuff. And I got sick. It's like, hey, we don't have time for this. Pop a bunch of vitamin C, put some sweats on, sweat it out. You'll be okay the next day. That's it. That's our cure. All right. And so my mom's feeding me soup at the age of 40. I'm like, yeah, stay another week. Feed me soup. I don't know. And that's the first memory of the age of 40. Now, I was cuddled and hugged. and so I wasn't detached of order, disorder, that kind of stuff. But here's this, this leper who can't be touched and then has to go around and yell, unclean, unclean, unclean. And he touched him. And we'll see this in other gospel accounts where he touched him. And it, <gasps> I can't believe he touched him. I mean, just that, that point right there, just being touched. I mean, that would just been healing right there. And someone just finally, I finally felt the embrace and the touch. Even lepers weren't even supposed to be touching each other, even though they hung out with one another. And this guy goes and gets healed. But the story doesn't end there. So yeah, this great touch. He's got his first mommy feeding him soup story. I mean, he's got that. But, but here's the thing. He goes and he tells him, he says, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 are two of the longest chapters in Leviticus, and it's about the cleansing of disease and the offerings of this one. 13 and 14. No one, a Gentile, Naaman, the Syrian, was healed by the Jordan River but of leprosy. And Miriam was given little spots of leprosy there because of her prejudice for Moses for marrying a black woman, an Ethiopian woman. And she was present. And he said, you little prejudice there? <laughs> How about leprosy? Ah! Moses was given a little leprosy. He says, here's the end. Put, put it in the cloth there. comes out. It's here, there, just to, but that's it. No recorded case. No use for Leviticus 13 and 14. Do you understand the narrative that's going on here? Caiaphas and Annas, the high priest, not supposed to have two high priests. In fact, these aren't even the priests who are even legitimately supposed to even be there. They're put there by the Roman government. So they're not even in the line of Aaron in the true priesthood. But Annas was a high priest for about 11 years, and then his son Caiaphas becomes high priest, and they're both reigning and ruling together. And he says, go show yourself to the priest as a testimony to them. Now, Jesus didn't say, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, you know, for, I've heard this, I've heard this damnable heresy. I've heard it from others, and I've tried to talk to other pastors. He said, now, Jesus was just using reverse psychology. He's just using, he's saying, don't say something, because you know someone will say it. He wasn't using reverse psychology. That lets me know that that person is biblically illiterate because you go back and read Leviticus. I go back and read Leviticus 13 and 14. What's the whole deal with this thing? You're to take two turtle doves. You're to twist the neck off of one 
And you're to pour it in a bowl of what they call living water. Holy water. Up in the UP, it's holy wa. All right, but understand this. Hey, you're supposed to put and drain the blood into this water. And then you're to take the other dove that's alive and bring it through the water and set it free. Hmm. Blood in the living water. Next bird put under in through the water, through the cover through the blood, set free. I wonder, I wonder what that's a picture of. And then he goes and he says, go and do this to the priests. So that's a testimony for them. Understand this. Jesus is going back for Caiaphas and Annas. He's going back for them. Understand this. When someone stands before the Lord and gives an account of their life, I, I don't know all the things that goes on. God's the one who's going to be able to judge. But I understand this, that no one will be without an excuse. God does not send anyone to hell. If anyone ever gives you that, why would God send anyone? No, God doesn't send anyone to hell. He created hell for the fallen angels and those who have departed from and that was it. If a person ends up there, it's your own choice. Again, if you're hiding and running from God, you found a strange place to hide today. Understand this, that, that they choose to be there. That's your own choice. Unlike the garden, there was no choice. Adam and Eve were put there. And then they were provided a Savior later when they fell from that grace. But you and I, we have a choice right now. And we can choose. You can say, oh, I didn't ask to be born. Okay, great. Well, you're here now. And you don't have to stay this way. And you can get covered by the blood of the Lamb. And you can be covered and you can be set free. Were you lying when you were singing those songs today? And the words that were coming out, I mean, do you believe in these things? So understand this, that this is a testimony to them. This is their inside joke. And you see that if you just go and study the history and you read Leviticus 13 and 14 and you go back and say, why did, just as Moses commanded, understand this, they, just think if he just shows up. He says, well, I'm to go to this. But here's what's happened. Not only that, when that person was cleansed with leprosy so they could be brought back into the fellowship, you couldn't just walk around and say, well, I was healed, I was healed, I was healed, I was healed. The priest had to say, this person was healed, and he could say, "Eh, everyone's cool. Everyone's cool. I gave my life to the Lord, and I was a little rough around the edges. I got saved and baptized that night, and I came back to my private room of 120 guys. And it just and they're like, what, what happened to you tonight? Well, I got blankety blank saved, and Jesus is in my blankety blank heart. I mean, a little rough around the edges. Still had some vocabulary issues, uh, but that wasn't the least of my concern. That was the least of the concerns. And one of the sergeants who I had persecuted mercilessly went out of my way to persecute this guy. And all these new Christians who had been coming to the Lord in the last couple of weeks there, and and they're surrounding me, and they're like, oh, really, you're because I was I was very brutal. Okay, I mean, no one's ever seen me this way, but I was very brutal. And, and they're like, really, you're a Christian? And you know, stuff like that. And I'm just cussing. I'm like, oh, you better believe I'm a blankety-blank Christian. I'll knock your blankety-blank, blank, 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 blank head off. And just, <laughs> da, 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 da. You hear me? You hear me, you jerk? I'm saved. I'm saved. <laughs> All right? And they're like, how do you know something? You're going to see Jesus right now. And he'll tell you. Sergeant Miller comes. I said, oh, Sergeant Miller. And I just began to, just began to weep and just, man, I've just given my life to Jesus. I'm just doing stuff like that. And Sergeant Miller turns around to everyone and says, hey, he's a little rough around the edges. He's a little green, but he's in. Oh, praise the Lord. I'm like, blank and blank the Lord. And <laughs> but I was grafted. I was brought in. There was someone that I could show myself to and he could say, this, he's, he's in. All right, let's get together. That's what's supposed to happen. The high priest, the priests were supposed to go there and then they would cleanse them. They would see all the stuff. Not only that, then for eight days, you were to be put out in the sun. You were put out for eight days. And then you come back after the eight days and oh, no leprosy, it's all gone. And then you were brought before the congregation. They're in Jerusalem there. And they said they would pronounce this man clean. Do you understand? There's no miracles going on until Jesus shows up. Do you understand? These guys have... Oh, uh, what, what do we do? I think there's something back in Leviticus. They've never used it. Okay, so... How does it... How do we do... Now, I had a similar experience. I, had a, I have got a three and a half inch screw in my shoulder. And I'm the Navy docs are the ones working on the Marines. And I'm going for the surgery. And they don't knock me out. They give me a little shoulder block. And it was a brand new procedure. They set the manual... 
on my stomach. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay, don't touch that. We could paralyze him. Uh huh. Now, I've worked under the hood of a car. I know how this goes. And he goes, Did you read this ahead of time? I mean, nowadays it looks cool because it's digital on the internet. And some doctor can do operate on someone in Alaska in the middle of nowhere. I mean, but they're laying the book on my stomach and they're, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Okay, don't touch that one. All right, there. This is what they're saying. If we cut that, he's paralyzed for life. You know, I'm right here. Do you understand? These guys are getting together for doing Leviticus 14. Okay, we're supposed to. Ooh, you wanna, you wanna do that? Kind of old. Here, you do it. Get, oh, and drain it into the. You understand? These guys aren't in the line of Aaron. They're not really fulfilling in the whole priesthood. They're really not doing it. They're just ripping people off. And now someone shows up and says, "This is what you got to do." And they're not true, really, Jewish people in the sense of, of following the law. But Jesus did this not for a reverse psychology, as a testimony to them. And then Caiaphas and, and I would have to see this and go, wow. It is there. Also understand this. Jesus Christ said, I have come to fulfill all of the law. Not one crossing of the T, not one dotting of the I. Nothing in the law shall perish until everything is fulfilled. We've seen that he was baptized. He identified with the sinners. We see that the Holy Spirit was upon me. We see all the, the things of temptation. He's, he's experienced everything that we'll ever experience, all of us put together. And he's coming and he's fulfilling the law. He's fulfilling everything. And so he does this as a testimony for them. Very poignant. And then you're supposed to be grafted and brought back in. And everyone's pronounced this. I mean, they, they're just curious. I mean, how do you do this? And then... You hear about Jesus and the man who said they, they, they brought him on a bed and they couldn't. There's so many people in the crowds and so what do they do? They start ripping the tiles up of his roof and they lower him down and Jesus says, "Rise, be healed." And he's like, "Well," and they begin to reason and mind, who can do this but God? Who can do this but God? You see, they know that only God can heal. And they give him a description, even in Isaiah of what the Messiah would look like. He'd give sight to the blind. blind the he would heal people. He would cleanse people. People would raise from the dead. They would walk again. These are the things that are going on. He, and, and Jesus is doing these things. Even John and this, the Baptist, even in his doubt in prison, says, go, make sure this is one. We already know from Scripture that he's, they're cousins. They knew each other, but go, go and ask them. They said, are you the one? And Jesus just doesn't simply say, yes, I'm the one. He just says, look, I'm doing all these things that only the Messiah would do when he shows up. He goes back, John goes, okay, yeah, that's the one. Okay, just making sure here. He's doing these things. I mean, who can do it? And Jesus does this. Remember, there's Pharisees there. There's the scribes there. These Pharisees, and remember, we don't hear about Pharisees and Sadducees until the New Testament. Because when they could no longer worship and the temple was destroyed and, and they could not get to the temple, they came up with a tradition. This will help you understand a little bit more in the New Testament of the Apostle Paul. They came up with this thing called synagogue. If ten devout Jewish men wanted to worship God and they can get a hold of some Torah, they can get the scrolls, or they can get the Torah there, they can have a synagogue. It was a house of worship. And if there wasn't ten devout Jewish men who would want to get together and worship... Then you were to go a couple miles out of town and by the river and have a meeting place. Well, how would they set up a tradition and how would they know there was a river in any town you go to? Water's life, folks. They couldn't pump the water in and cities were developed around rivers. That's is why Paul could, he saw that there was no one in Philippi. There was no synagogue. So he just showed out on the Sabbath, saw some people by the riverside. We know Lydia was there and a few other prominent women. He says, oh, that's, that's pretty, pretty sure they're Jewish. Because they're doing something on the Sabbath. They're only there out there and they're worshiping. And he began to lead them to the Lord. So these synagogues pop up. And these Pharisees and these Sadducees believe in different various things of the Torah. And they come up with their own interpretation. And Jesus confronts them both. And they're saying, who can do this but God? And he says, to show you not only that I can heal, but what's easier to say? Rise up and take your mat and walk or your sins are forgiven. That's the greater need, folks. That's the greater need right there. He says, look, raise up and take him out and your sins have been forgiven you. That's what he says. Who can forgive sins but God? And he heals him and he does this stuff and he takes his mat up and he walks. Now you know this guy instantly became a Christian and he acted like a Christian because they didn't go back and repair the guy's roof. I mean, I don't have an account of that, all right? 
No, look, hey, look, he goes here and he's walking and, and again, he's doing these things. And then this other point where we see that he sees Matthew, the, the tax collector. Levi is his name. And he walks up to him and says, follow me. Matthew knows about him. And Matthew gives this feast in his house. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they're not there. You understand, it's very communal living. And when you had someone prominent over in your house, you would be looking in the windows. I mean, people would just be around. What's he eating now? What's he doing? What's going on there? And the Pharisees are outside and they're arguing with his disciples. Well, John's disciples, you know, they fast and pray. Wait a minute. You didn't even accept John the Baptist. And now you're, you're using him as a reference? You didn't like him before. And now you're saying, well, even his, I, mean, well I mean, granted, we don't like John's disciples, but even his disciples they had a little bit of piety to them. And Jesus, and, and Jesus knows what they're doing. They're reasoning in their hearts. And that's oftentimes where God speaks to us right now. Because He's reasoning in their hearts and He's able to answer their questions what the true question is. What the true question is, is that, how can this be? He says, how can they fast when the bridegroom's here? But there will be a day. There will be a day that they will fast. But right now I'm with them. Right now I'm with them. Jesus made other statements like that through the other Gospels there. When Judas because he was a thief. But he said, you know, that perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor and all the other disciples. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus says, the poor you'll always have with you. But me, you won't. Choose that good thing. Choose that good thing to be with Jesus. And he goes to Matthew and says, follow me. Matthew does. He gives a feast. And not only that, what does he do? He invites everyone else. You've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why that is happening in great hordes even today, in great company today, because there's that fear, folks. Getting back to that. Perfect love drives out fear. Why aren't we inviting people to church? Why aren't we bringing them to the host? I've, I've got to share this with you. I know people who will love to tell you about Prime America and Amway and Fuller Brush and some marketing scheme or whatever. You've got to get together. You've got to know this. But yet when it comes to the very thing that gives eternal life, Jesus Christ, oh, I wonder what they'll think about me. You might go on the YouTube and this guy goes around and he says, look, I'll give you $100. You're a Christian, I'm a Christian. You're born again, I'm born again. I believe in the Lord. I'll give you $100 if you go over and tell that person about Jesus that they need to give their life to Jesus. I'll do that. And they run over there. I'll tell you about Jesus. He comes back and says, oh, okay, here's your 100 bucks. He says, have you ever done that before? No. Well, how come you only do it if I give you 100 bucks? Well, uh, uh, and you see the whole setup there. What are we so afraid of, folks? Let us be rude enough to get people into heaven, not polite enough to let them go to hell. Now understand this. Everyone will stand before the Lord. God has already had certain things in their lives. That God's already done things and they'll stand before the Lord. And we're like, you know, I never told that person on the bus or I never told that person. And when they stand before the Lord, I don't know who. I didn't share with everyone how, how many times the gospel was shared with me and how many Bible tracts and how many times I watched Billy Graham on television before getting saved and how I used to get drunk and read the Bible or smoke dope and get high and try to read the Bible and get spiritual in these things. And you, I suggest that you see other things. And, but, but understand this is that, that he says, follow me. And then finally, he just ends with this whole thing of that, well, what about us, these Pharisees? He says, look, he says, I'm pouring new wine into new wineskins. And understand this, you have to understand this. Wine, when the grapes are crushed and stuff like that, and it gets through the fermenting process. Before that, you have to put it in new wineskins, just goat skins that are sewn together. And that when the wine, again, expands, there's gases in there, and it expands and expands and expands until the, the, the whole thing of that, that, that goat skin. After that, it can only be used for water, to hold water, or non-expanding gaseous materials. Uh, and he says, look, if you put new wine into old wineskins, it's, it's just going to burst and the whole thing is going to get wasted. And that's what each and every one of us, I mean, he doesn't want to pump into old religion. He doesn't want to pump into an old person. He, he wants to put new wine into new wineskins and you can change. He tells us in Corinthians there that for, for you are a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. The old things have gone. Behold, behold, all things have become new. You're a brand new creation in Christ and you can change. Your DNA has not set your life in order. But you can change through Christ Jesus daily being conformed to the image of Christ. And again, the same thing. You can't take a new piece of cloth, put it on old, and then shrink and tear and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know if he's given us winemaking and sewing classes, but he, he's given us illustrations here that he's taken the very common of the day and he says he's putting into you and I. Are you that new wineskin that he can pour his, his oil into? Are you that new 
creation in Christ. Well, I'll tell you this as we finish up. Timmy, like that song here? Well, that's a clue to get up now. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> he's new here. So. That, 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 first and foremost, forsaking. Maybe it's today, April 25th, all day, 2010. Maybe this is the day that you just say, I'm going to forsake all. This is it. It's all for you, Jesus. I'm just going to forsake all. And maybe this is the day that, that God can speak to you. And maybe this is going to be the day that you're finally going to obey His Word. That Jesus is going to speak to you. But He tells you, don't be afraid. And I'm telling you from personal experience, you can get fearful of those things because you must choose the cross. And as we heard in the, as I retreat this weekend at the conference, you know, getting a flat tire. That's not the cross, folks. Having a bad hair day. That's not the cross. Getting fired from a job. That's not the cross. The cross is suffering. The cross is choosing the shame of this, that the world calls a shame and choosing Jesus Christ and forsaking all. Not just simply having fire insurance, but having Jesus Christ as your Lord. And then He'll pour that new wine into you. And you get to totally radically change in Him. But you first must forsake all. Would you please stand and let's pray. Lord Jesus, And Lord, I know by experience I have followed you and then I've gone back to fishing or growing dope or whatever. I've, I've gone back and you've, came, you've come back for me, Lord. And that Jesus, that you are Lord and Savior of my life, I would pray that you would be that for each and every one of us here today. And that God, we, we, we would be obedient to your word. And just like this leper, we would go and show ourselves... And be restored to what? Just humanity and to this world. But we would be restored, most importantly, to a right relationship with you. And that, God, that you would proclaim your glory and testimony through us. And that, Lord, that we can share the good news of you, Lord Jesus. That we know that our sins are forgiven. And, Lord, we could be reasoning in our hearts right now, but, Lord, you're answering those questions. Because you tell them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but you have come to seek those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And it just isn't lip service. To repent means to make a U-turn on the road of life, going 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Because everything I've done up to this point has brought me where I'm at, and it's not not working. So, Lord, you have called sinners to repent. If that's you today, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you, maybe if you've walked away and you're backslidden right now, but if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, do that today. But unlike raising your hand and coming forward and saying, just as I am, those who brought you here today, those who come here today, or somehow you, go and show yourself and let them know that you've been clean. And simply ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin, to come into your life, and to receive Him forevermore. And make it the day that not only is the day that you are following Him, but the day that you are forsaking all for Him only. We praise you and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. For those who have been wavering and wondering and are on the fence, Lord, we pray that they're knocked off. And you tell us in Revelation that you'd rather than be hot or cold. And I'd rather than be that way because it's easier to see where you're at. But I pray with all of them. Every one of us here would be hot. Hot for you. So new wine must be put into new wineskins. Both are preserved, and no one having drunk of the old wine immediately desires, no one drinking the old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. Jesus, be the same as you were 2,000 years ago as you are right now. I desire you. We all desire you. So we praise you and we thank you for this day in Jesus' name.